<laughs> my guess is, with, with us starting to go over things, we'll probably talk about prologue in chapter one. And my, I'm thinking that's probably where we're going to cut off. Um, and then like, we'll go through the rest of the stuff with, uh, with tomorrow. Um, so knowing that we'll do stuff with prologue in chapter one, what would be like other questions or concerns that folks are like, all right, I, I definitely need to make sure at some point today or tomorrow we talk about this. For example, first period was saying like chapter five. I need to talk about chapter five, and, and we're getting a you know follow up on, on that one. Um, can you talk about the That's chapter five. Oh, okay. Like your, the, the Homer Barbie speech? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's chapter five. So I'm just putting a little mental note that we'll get to it. I don't think we're going to talk about it today. Um, my guess is tomorrow is going to be more dealing like school stuff that, that we'll um, get into. Could you go over the part where they go to the, where Morton and, uh, well, Dr. True Blood, we'll go True Blood Golden Day. Um, when they go to the hospital, just a lot of names. Or, 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 what do you mean? Uh, you mean the Golden, there's no hospital. Like the, um, the Golden Day? Yeah, I think. Super Cargo? Yeah, Super Cargo. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's at the bar. Okay. It's kind of wrong. I thought they were at the hospital. Not to be confused with the hospital. Oh, <laughs> um, they were at the hospital all the time. Um, I'm just thinking, well, try to not find a chapter. Prologue? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, the actual chapter one. We'll get into chapter one. Okay. Okay, so Super Cargo. An awesome name? Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's the attendant. Is he white? Like, no. Okay, and then that guy on the train with the vet. Crenshaw? Like, yeah, is he, is he like the care? Like, what is his he's, he's also like attendant to make sure that he basically is taking him from, we don't really know exactly where they are, but in, in the south to um, the D.C. So for, for the transfer. Right? Yes. Okay, because like they were saying like when you were sitting back here, too, so that was confused. Like, yeah. So Crenshaw is basically just there to make sure he gets from point A to point B, you know, follow suit with everything. Supercargo works at, at the asylum, um, but but he and obviously the big guy, uh, and we'll get into his name and all that stuff more so tomorrow. But he's black, um, just as all the patients would be. So in chapter three, Golden Day, the only white person you would have in the whole bar, brothel slash hospital type place for COVID would, would be Mr. White. Wait, the vet? I don't, I'm kind of confused with the character. He was also black. Mm -hmm. the, that doctor? He was the yes. same guy from like. So the guy in chapter, so chapter seven is the one that, um, this is what you're asking about with, with Crenshaw. So when, when uh, the narrator, when Tim is going from the south to the north, because his name is Tim. Um, narrator? Yeah, narrator thing's Tim. Mind blowing. How do you know? Because I know. So when, when Tim's going from point A to point B, um, the vet doctor that he's riding on the bus is the same guy that he's in the Golden Day with that goes, I used to be a physician, I did brain surgeries in France, and all this kind of stuff. So um, so he's giving him some lessons, not really kind of lessons, but, but the stuff that he's saying in Chapter 7 is because he already knows who this guy is from the Golden Day. And it's certainly no mistake that the vet doctor is getting transferred at the same time that Tim's getting kicked out of school um, because Bledsoe would have kind of control over all of those things. He doesn't want someone like the vet doctor giving his students terrible ideas. And by terrible ideas, anything that goes against Tim is going to be terrible. Okay. I was hoping for like a potato or something. Yeah. The panther. Okay. <laughs> You'll figure it out. Wait, did you tell him what? Did you tell him you wanted me to say Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're going to come off with me. Jim is true blood. Tim is. Um, what, do we, what, what do we know about prologue? Like, what, what do you get? What do you get about narrator here, like in the opening? Because keep in mind, prologue, like that that version of narrator Tim slash I is different from narrator Tim slash I in chapter one. Like. You have kind of like naive narrator in the story. Then you have, I don't want to say mature, all-knowing narrator, but you have, he's certainly in a different place in the prologue. Because you're going back, you know, roughly 20 years, um, back to his, his graduation speech, which wasn't really a good scene for him. Um, what, what do we know about him in the prologue? He's a 
waging a war on the company. Okay. So yeah, probably the, the biggest feature about his um, his place is kind of, and he refers to it as his whole, his home. He becomes whole. W H O L E within his whole H O L E is that he surrounds himself in light. And you know the number 1,369 light bulbs. It'll be one of those things that your senior year of college you'll probably still remember for some reason and you'll be mad about it. Um, where is he? Like, where is his home? He's, just, he's not in Harlem. He goes, I'm just outside of Harlem. He's right by it. Because what kind of building is he in? It's, a, it's an apartment building, but it's a white tenant apartment building. So, you know, there's, there's a little bit more. You said, like, waging a war against the power company. I'm also kind of waging a war against, like, management who has no idea I'm here. I'm in the white place. I'm not in Harlem. I'm by it, but I'm just outside. So he's like in this abandoned basement surrounded with his light bulbs of this white apartment building. Allie? So if he like lives there, doesn't pay anything? Nope. Does he have a job? Like, don't we know of? Well, what, what he seems to be pretty good at, that. that no, we don't know of any job that he would have. And based on, you do kind of find out throughout the course of the book how he ends up in, in this place. Um, no, he, he's not working, you know, at a diner or any other kind of, you know, place um, where, where he'd have steady income. What he does, though, is he finds a way to, to kind of get by. Um, he's waging war against the power company. Anyone remember the name of the power company? It does start with an M. It's almost like the board game. It's not Monopoly, but it's Monopolated um, Light and Power Company. Now, Ellison likes to do a lot of things with puns. So, Tim talks about, I become whole within my whole. He says, I'm not, I'm not staying down here um, because he's not hiding, but he's in a state of hibernation. I'm hibernating. I'm going to come back. Um, so he goes, like, call me Jack the Bear. And then later on, he goes, you know, I'm going to tell you my story. Bear with me. Um, Norton is a what for the school? Not a professor. He's a trustee. But he is certainly not to, and the vet doctor would pretty much say he is not someone who you should trust. Um, so he does a lot of punny type things throughout. True blood, you can tell within the family, they are true blood based on, on, on what's happening. Now, he's waging war against the power company. What is he doing to monopolated light and power? Since he's taking their energy, and this alley is kind of going to get to the answer of your question, he is doing what to them? He is They have been manipulated by Tim. So how does he get by, Ali, to your original question? At this point, you have more kind of mature narrator, where a guy who is kind of naive and willing to get beat up in order to give a graduation speech, in the prologue, he's somebody who will do whatever is necessary for him to get by. So it's not just light that he is stealing, but when you go buy light bulbs at Home Depot or Lowe's, there's usually two numbers that are on there. You have lumens, which will tell you how bright the light bulb is. But then you also have what other number goes up on the light bulbs? Watts. Lumens are for light. Watts are for what? Power. So he's manipulating what kind of power? The white power by, I'm in the white tenant building. I'm down there. They know someone's tapping into their energy, but they can't figure out who it is. So he, you know, I don't know how many watts each light bulb has. If he had like 50 watt light bulbs, he has over 60,000 watts of power. So what you have is a guy who is learning 
or starting to decide I need to accumulate power? Well, I mean, they know it's happening. Yeah, like they just the can't. Basement, right? They just can't figure out what's. And and for us, like we don't really kind of think about it as much. And I'm certainly there's some figurative, you know, literary freedom that is kind of being taken here. Um, but older cities, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, um, there's basically like abandoned under cities, you know, kind of neat. Um, London would be a much more extreme, or Paris. You know, they didn't really always tear the buildings down. What would you do? You build up over on top of them. So in parts of New York, they would absolutely be underground areas that are, are essentially kind of boarded off and, and no one would go into. So he's just kind of found his little warm spot that, that he's got to stay at. Um, he's not living in the sewer. You know, he's not a teenage mutant into turtle with splinter, as John started to think of in his head. Um, <laughs> But he found his own little hole that I'm going to stay at. Um, and, and you can, he's kind of started to figure out there might be some advantages to being invisible. Um, and he has urges, you know, sometimes that, hey, it might not be a curse. He runs into the guy, doesn't say, excuse me, ends up beating him up. And then he's, you know, kind of been mugged by a ghost because he's able to disappear. The, the issue that you kind of deal with for Tim is you have a person who's never been recognized. Now he's going to start to try to use it to, to his advantage. So getting food and what money he needs, you get a sense he's a crafty old veteran at this point that he, he would be able to do whatever he needs to, to survive. But this is a very stark contrast to the guy that you have in Chapter 1, you know, who, who is totally naive and all that kind of stuff. Um, so prologue is kind of setting the scene, but it certainly sets up kind of like a, a, an additional motif of power, craving of power becomes a big thing. Um, Bloodsoe would be a perfect example of a person who is trying to get power and will use people to his advantage for it. In some ways it seems as if Tim kind of becomes a little bit of a mini Bloodsoe by the end, even though Bloodsoe was using him. now. Um, Tim's going to manipulate and use other people for, for his own benefit. Any other parts with prologue? That's like his dreams. Um, so kind of like going back and forth with like consciousness and reality. I mean, you know, he's, he has his own like little reefer dream that's kind of taking place. So um, state of consciousness isn't always there. You um, and, and, and you have... You have a dream going back to um, to, to, to selling of, um, of slaves. Um, and so you have folks who were not seen as people, not recognizable, and that's kind of the same issue that Tim's dealing with. What's the boss for the destroyer? He will show up. I think I saw the name in the new Avengers. You have you had Roz in the prologue, and then in chapter eight. When he comes out of the subway, yeah. okay, um, in New York City, he looks down the road and there's a guy talking to people. That's Roz. Roz is going to have more of a role later on as, as we go. The same guy. Yep. So he'll he'll show up. So you don't you don't really see him as a main person yet in, in chapter nine. Um, Roz is going to kind of start more when you get into 16, 17, 18. This is when he'll play a little bit of a bigger role. Are you going to ask him when does he show up later? Um, when he, when Tim is going through all, like, he just mentions, like, people that he's encountered before. He says, Ra's the destroyer. Like, I'm glad um, you escaped in the night, so Ra's the destroyer. Yeah. I'm Which getting too far ahead of the story. Right, because that's going to make sense much later yeah. on. And when you meet Roz, he's Roz the exhorter, which means he exhorts people, he urges people to do something, and then later on he gets a new moniker with Roz the, the destroyer. He rides around on horseback and throws spears. It's pretty cool. New Sean would like that part. Battle Royale. Kind of good in a way. Yeah. No. Oh. No. Does he wake up at the end? He he has a there is a dream at the end um, where grandfather's dream. 
Um, so after he gets scholarship and all, after he's given his speech, he then has the dream back with his grandfather, um, and where he's opening up all the envelopes and stuff. And so he wakes up from that one. But the whole encounter with him going through the boxing matches and stuff, that, that part is taking place, which is kind of unnerving in, in a lot of ways. I don't, wait, so he was, so he boxed and then he gave a speech? Yep. I was just confused, like, why that, like, why was he giving the speech? Why was he boxing? It just all was Well, what's, what's the speech? You said his graduation. His graduation yeah. speech. So he's given his graduation speech, and then the it's it's so wonderful that it's thought that he should give this graduation speech to who else? Who should have the the opportunity to listen to it? All the like the high up white people in in town. Um, so you so far as the audience, it's a white audience that would be made up of leaders. So you have lawyers. Doctors. Is this like a common like thing to happen, like having these um, memorials? I hope not. Um, there was, there was some, like, there's someone. I am having like some WWE stage. That's what I imagine. That's what I imagine. It'd be like a ballroom. No, I imagine. Like a ball, ballroom. <laughs> so you're at like hotel. You know, we're we're at the Chadwick. And then they would be having this this whole thing unfold. So, <laughs> last day chance to buy your tickets tomorrow. Yes. So you've got your white audience, and then you have your black fighters. So everyone in the match is black. Does Tim have any idea that he's going to be getting in a boxing match when he shows up? Absolutely not. Oh, so. You want to give a speech? Okay, here's your gloves. You can go fight first. <laughs> Fighters. Okay. Battle Royale okay. fight then is last man standing. So you just keep knocking each other out till you get down to the last two, and then it's winner take all. So it's Tim against Tatlock at, at, at the very end, because pretty much everyone else realizes they're going to get their butts whooped. Well, so they kind of fall out. What makes the fight all the more difficult? They're blindfolded. What kind of blindfold? Oh, wait. No, I'm thinking of Ellen Davis. It's not a red blindfold. It's not a blue blindfold. It is not a black blindfold. It is a white blindfold. Certainly... There is meant to be some symbolism taking place in the sense that the, the, the blacks are being blinded by the white. Now, take a look at some juxtaposition that's kind of happening based on the prologue. What does old Tim do? I'm taking all this white light, and where before I'm being blindfolded by whiteness, I'm going to use this whiteness, this power now to illuminate my world so I can see... But again, this is old Tim versus young, naive, okay, I'll do whatever I can, Tim. The main question that folks have would be, why in the world would anyone, like, want to do this? The easy answer is because they can't. It's south. There's certainly racism going on. They're, the winner of the fight gets money. Um, so, you know, there is some advantage to it. Tim does not sign up for it, but is he going to go through with it? Yes, I'll do this because I want to give my graduation speech. So, no, it is not an appropriate thing to happen at, uh, by any means, but it is something that they can do because they can for amusement. Certainly, and remember, this is the chapter that is, kind of, that is written first, it's a standalone, and then the rest of the book kind of gets built around it. It's, I would certainly say, meant to be allegorical in nature, where the whole entire thing is kind of symbolic. If you want to do something for the white audience, you have to go through some type of rite of passage. So kind of think of it almost as like an initiation. You want to talk to us? Fine. Get the crap beat out of you first. Then you can give your speech. Okay. Oh, and here's some, uh, some money. Bzz. Whoops. They're not really money. It's just brass tokens. And we're going to make you, you know, uncomfortable by having the white stripper run around. <laughs> so that was my question, the whole shock. Round. 
entertainment again, like because you can. Okay. Um, now, what's his speech that he gives? Well, social responsibility is part of it, but you know the speech that he gives. Yeah, but, but what is the speech that he is giving? He, he says, cast down your bucket multiple times. His speech that he is giving is the Atlanta. And certainly at this point, it's not going to be the Atlanta address, but it is going to be the Atlanta compromise. Why is the Atlanta compromise an appropriate speech for him? He will compromise, and you could certainly, you know, put a whole bunch of terms here for it. Um, he's compromising, literally, you could just say his self. Um, he's compromising his dignity. He's compromising, um, you know, you could say morals. Uh, certainly his health, his safety. But the Atlanta compromise is, you know, certainly that speech, cast down your bucket, we can help each other out. I'm willing to start at the bottom, work my way up and everything will be okay. We can be as separate as the fingers. Hey, boxing match where you have like a hand speech kind of taking place, but it's a perfect speech for him to give. No, it's not, oh my goodness, he plagiarized his speech, but it would be Allison going, hey, let's take a look at this compromise. Now, where then does he go to school for the scholarship? They never say Tuskegee, but the founder is certainly conveyed to be Booker T. Washington. You're going to Tuskegee, so you're willing to compromise with us. Well, we'll send you to the school that will teach you how to compromise, you know, basically the rest of your life. Now, when we said, what was the speech that he gave? A lot of you started going, oh, he says social equality when he is supposed to say responsibility. When he's giving his speech, certainly no one seems to be listening at all, but when he goes social equality, all the ears perk up, what, what did you say? And before he switches it to responsibility, he has to do something physically. He takes a, he has to clear his throat, and he has to swallow his own blood because he's been punched in the mouth, you know, all this stuff over and over again. So while he's compromising, he has to compromise all of this stuff, swallow his blood, swallow his words, and go, sorry, sir, I meant to say social responsibility. Once he corrects himself, then at that point, nice job, young man, and this is when you get your scholarship. At that point, by him getting his scholarship, everything that he did in Tim's mind was worth it. Okay, I got my scholarship. And besides the scholarship, he also gets a Ellison does something with the word briefcase. If you wrote it like that on your third grade spelling test, it should be marked wrong. Because briefcase is one word. It's a compound word. When Ellison uses it, it's always separated into two words. So it's certainly a physical item, but again, you have a little bit of a pun that's taking place where you have Tim underground is telling you his story. He's telling you, you don't consider 581 pages necessarily to be brief, but he's telling you his brief case, his brief argument, his brief account um, of everything that is going on. But this, certainly for chapter one, you would have symbolic object briefcase written down because anything and everything that goes into that briefcase is certainly going to be significant throughout. Um, you then have that dream afterwards where, uh, you know, with the grandfather, he's opening up the envelopes, and you get that closing line, you know, eat that, he uses another word, boy, running. Um, or Tim, if he's running without knowing where he's going, he's basically being controlled by other people. So at this point, for him going to school, young, naive, 
unknowing Tim is at the mercy of others, that's a far cry from the invisible man, Tim, that is stealing power unknowingly from other people and manipulating them to his benefit. So you have this brief case about how you go from young, naive guy to manipulating older guy over the course of the story. So True Blood, Norton, all those things, we'll talk about them tomorrow. Well, that was and all that stuff. That's 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 no, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, and I don't know if I'll post the poetry quiz tonight or tomorrow. Okay. So don't, don't keep, like, clicking on uh, okay. Google Classroom to find it. Yeah. Don't refresh it 15.